All right, everybody, hang tight. We're going to kick off in just a minute. Uh, this this episode today is going to talk about Bernie Sanders' endorsement of Joe Biden, what's really going on with this whole fawning of Andrew Cuomo, and we cover the great 1913 strike in New Zealand. Just hang tight. If you can, hit that like button, hit that share button. We're going to kick this episode off in just a moment. Okay, how are we doing, folks? We are kicking this thing off. We are getting into today's road reflection. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, thank you so much for checking it out uh, today. Uh, we got a we got a relatively big show, so I'm gonna try to do as quick of a check in as I possibly can. Um, trying to, you know, the, the point of these check-ins is to be um, open and honest about where we are uh, in, in mental health, physical health-wise in the current uh, pandemic situation that we are in um, and encouraging people to, to do the same uh, and support each other through whatever we are going, uh, going through um, on, a, on a personal level. Uh, I am enjoying myself a iced coffee with uh, with uh, I, I get the, the the ginger turmeric coconut milk uh, from Trader Joe's, which is uh, what I'm what I'm enjoying. Uh, it's a nice little refreshing beverage. Had some um, coffee left over from uh, in my French press from yesterday, so I decided uh, let's make it into a nice coffee for the afternoon. But uh, I'm feeling okay. Today seems today has kicked off into a uh, a better start. Uh, still a little bit late. Still a little bit late. Um, but yesterday I was able to stay up um, and do a little bit of extra work, do a little bit of extra researching, little little design um, design stuff. Um, got to exercise finally. Um, boy, you know that that really fucking helps out a lot. Uh, the exercising situation. Um, just getting getting the blood flowing a little bit more um feeling feeling fit feeling uh better i'm I'm sore in the chest area in the in the abs area in the arms area and stuff um i'm gonna try to increase that today um you know maybe add a couple more exercises into it extend the exercise routine just a little bit more uh hopefully get um some writing done for taboo table talk that is going to be the goal for uh, for the evening is taboo table talk writing, possibly some forkful writing, possibly some drawing. Um, I have uh, a couple of friends that have released some new um, new albums, um, either just recently um, and uh, uh, or or uh, as recent as just a few weeks before the pandemic. And usually, when I'm on the road, it's really tough for me to listen to these albums. So I have that. Um, in, in my purview as well. Um, so I'm doing a lot better. I felt very scattered yesterday and even as I was releasing, you know, the episode and I was kind of, um, hanging out in the chats and, um, you know, I would, I would kind of pay attention, um, uh, back to what, what I say. Um, you know, I, I, I felt very jumbled. I, I felt like, uh, there were parts of it that weren't very, um, very good or up to par, uh, in my opinion. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know how you guys felt about it. I don't know if you could tell, but I felt like I was rushing through. I wasn't really taking my time. Um, I wasn't, um, you know, in, in that spontaneous mode in the groove that I normally, uh, feel like I'm in when I do these, these recordings here. Um, but I am feeling, um, a lot better. I'm excited to talk about, um, uh, the, the, the subject matter at hand today, um, you know, uh, a couple of these I've been waiting to, uh, I've been, I've been trying to figure out exactly how to talk about them. So, um, yeah, I hope, uh, I hope you guys are ready. I hope you guys are get, uh, getting into it. I hope you guys have hit that share button. Uh, I hope you guys, uh, are, are, are getting comfy. I hope you have a drink as well, whether it is caffeinated, non-caffeinated, alcoholic, non-alcoholic, whatever it is. I hope you're enjoying your evening cheers to you and let us begin so 
Uh, I kind of missed this uh, yesterday until like later in the day that um, Bernie Sanders had endorsed Joe Biden. And um, I had a feeling, uh, you know, if we if we didn't see it now, if we didn't see it, um, you know, because he suspended his campaign, what, 10 days ago, maybe? Um, I can't, I can't remember the exact time that he suspended his campaign, but it wasn't that long ago. And I basically said within a week, uh, two weeks, he would endorse Joe Biden. And if he doesn't do it within that time frame, he'd do it at the convention. That was sort of um, the, uh, the thought process that I had. And here we are two weeks later. He endorses Joe Biden. Now, um, uh, a good friend of mine, uh, uh, Kelly Lane, had pointed out that uh, they all signed, um, you know, this piece of document that basically said whoever ends up being the uh, DNC nominee, um, that all of the all, all of the people running for president were going to uh, endorse them. The only one that didn't endorse Joe Biden uh, was Marianne Williamson. And I don't really give a shit about what you think about Marianne Williamson. I, um, my, the, the fact remains that she is the only one that didn't toe the establishment line. Uh, that she basically was just like, no, fuck this contract. This contract is bullshit. If she even signed the contract, I'm not sure if she did. But you can't run under the Democratic Party without signing that contract. So I'm assuming that she did. She basically said, fuck it. I'm going to go and follow what my... Uh, what my heart says, and um, endorse Bernie Sanders. Now, she's the only one that did that. Tulsi Gabbard didn't do that. Andrew Yang didn't do that. Uh, none of them did it. Um, none of them came out and, and stood by their principles rather than a contractual, ob uh, a con contractual agreement um, to the uh, corporate wing of the left, the corporate wing of the liberals, essentially. And that's what the Democratic Party is. And that's what the DNC is. The DNC is a private corporation um, that runs the election. The DNC and the RNC are both private corporations that run our elections. Uh, the, the convention is basically a corporate scam, um, essentially. And, and, that, and that's, you know, that's where our electoral system is. So, you know, that's something to consider in all of this. Do we want to continue supporting a system like this? Um, you know, because that's where the conversation is going. What the fuck do we do, right? Now, what's interesting to me is there's a lot of people uh, that got on everybody's case, right? They got on all the Bernie Sanders people's case of like, well, you got to vote for Joe Biden. You have to vote for Joe Biden. Um, and uh, my very quick response to that is, uh, no, we fucking don't. Who says we have to vote for this person? Do you not understand how a democracy works where we have choices in who we should vote for um, and not all Democrats are monoliths? And I don't, I'm not even a Democrat. Like, I don't consider myself to be a Democrat. Um, I think I might have considered myself to be a Democrat maybe in like 99, 2000, um, you know, and I was in this country for four years. I was 12 or 13 at that point. And at that point, uh, as a child, I might have considered myself to be a Democrat. Uh, after 2001, I kind of really didn't know where I fit in. It seemed like the Democrats were, were nicer than the Republicans. Um, and then as I grew older, the further and further away from being an actual Democrat I became, especially after 9-11, especially after 9-11, and especially after the Obama administration, too. I think... I think the Obama administration sealed the deal on the fact that I wasn't going to be a Democrat um, because Obama really didn't stand for hope and change. He wasn't really the, the um, you know, for, for lack of a better uh, term here, the maverick candidate that he that everybody envisioned him to be. Right. Um, he didn't cut through racial barriers. Um, he kind of towed the line of the corporate establishment. He his cabinet was picked by Citibank. Uh, he let the fossil fuel industry basically do whatever they want while, you know, going on a public level and um, and saying some nice platitudes about how we need to protect the earth and climate change and climate change and whatever. Uh, you know, he it, it deported the most amount of immigrants, created ICE, which is clearly a problem, which, which is which is 
escalated the immigration problem and the xenophobia and the racism that that was already existent at that time. You know, um, just because Obama uh, became the president didn't mean that racism was over, that we had solved all the problems from the civil rights era, that we had taken care of workers issues, that, you know, we were going to start teaching about the Black Panthers on an accurate level in high schools. We weren't going to we weren't doing any of that sort of stuff. So, um, you know, I, I, I got to I got to say I, I wasn't particularly Democrat. And when. Um, when I uh, saw that Bernie was going to run for uh, president under the Democratic ticket, I kind of had a little bit of hope uh, for the transformation of the Democratic Party. And that kind of failed in 2016. And then we arrived at Tulsi Gabbard and Andrew Yang and Bernie Sanders all on the same stage. And I was like, holy shit, this might be something. We might actually be able to pull this whole internal transformation uh, of the Democratic Party, we, we might be able to pull that off, right? We might actually be able to do this. And um, and then it became more and more evident uh, within the last three months that that was not going to happen. Um, you had first Andrew Yang endorsing Joe Biden, uh, which made no logical sense other than, you know, that he said he was going to, whatever, um, and, you know, if that's what we're going by, then, you know, Hillary Clinton has said some things that she was going to do and then she never fucking did it. Uh, Obama said he was going to do some things and then he never fucking did it. This whole he said he was going to do it is not a viable enough of an argument where if you're going to stand by your principles, then fucking stand by your principles. Uh, Tulsi Gabbard, same thing. She endorsed Joe Biden. You know, there was a Jimmy Dore interview um, and I watched that interview and, you know, I'm, I, I still think um, the value of these candidates uh, that uh, ran in the race was important. Uh, you did have Andrew Yang bringing universal basic income, even though it was sort of this very rudimentary version, this very compromised version of universal basic income. But we were still talking about it, uh, something that when I brought it up almost five years ago, um, you know, there were some people on my side, but then there were a lot of other people that were kind of, you know, shitting on me for, for bringing something up. And I would get the typical arguments of laziness and hand, handouts and, you know, uh, you're communist and all this other shit. Um, same thing with Tulsi Gabbard, but having the anti-war voice, um, having somebody that was holding the DNC accountable for what they were doing. All these were kind of important things. And then you had Bernie Sanders, who was kind of who, who kind of inspired these movements um, by by being the person that was consistent for 40 years. Um, and look, those are all credits that I don't think we're going to take away. But, you know, what I've come to realize over the years, and this is something that I know a lot of other progressive commentators have also said, Ron Placone, Graham Elwood, Jimmy Dore, Katie Halper. You know, I, I look at these guys as mascots for what the movement is. That's really what they are. Um, they're, they're not the movement. We are the movement. Um, if it's really not me, us, then then let's let's make it about us now. You know, um, so so now it's 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 come down to um the people that supported Bernie and Tulsi and Andrew, there's a Andrew Yang, there's there's a um uh, a good portion of us that are thinking for ourselves and saying, well, we need to find something different. Um, you know, the, when Andrew Yang endorsed Joe Biden, there was a percentage that were like, okay, well, we'll go to Tulsi or Bernie. And then when Tulsi did the same thing, there was a bunch of us that went, I guess Bernie's all we have left. And and then when, you know, when Bernie suspended his campaign, we were then just in the waiting room. We were in the waiting room for this endorsement. Um, and when it arrived, now the, now the question comes up to exactly what I said before, which is, you know, we carry the movement forward. There's already um, a couple different things of this whole Dem exit kind of thing of, of creating a party that's specifically meant for the people, creating a restructuring of, um, you know, just the government itself. And is, how is that going to be achieved? And perhaps it's going to be achieved with, a, you know, this sort of a national general strike idea. Um, you know, bringing the people into um, into the negotiating room 
um, and and really legislating and making laws that uh, uh, that m make more sense for for the the livelihood and the and the willingness of people than it does for um, you know uh, corporate interests, moneyed interests for uh, you know the the upper class, the billionaires, which is which they've been getting tax cuts and handouts from the government for 200 plus years. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think, uh, I think that's, and, and this is kind of what we're fighting for, right? So that movement still goes on. There's still third party options. There's a lot of different options where we don't have to co-opt into this two party system. And there are still people, intelligent people that I'm friends with that, that, you know, and it, and it saddens me to some degree um, that I see these intelligent people that are on the pulse of everything that 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 are that are willing to have um, you know open uh, heartfelt compassionate intellectual uh, discussions that want me to vote for Joe Biden um, and they want me to vote for Joe Biden because he's a, he's not Trump right uh, which is false because I think they're not very different I, I they're virtually the same. I, there might be a little 1% difference. Um, and I will get into that in a moment because I know I've talked about this um, possibly ad nauseum. I understand that. Um, I do understand that I know I've, I've made these arguments before. And I know I'm not going to convince all of you uh, to view this, but, but I'm still going to encourage um, you know, some critical thought, some... Um, Let's move beyond the uh, the the letter of the party. Let let's let's move beyond you know. Uh, well, he's not this other guy. Those those are not those aren't arguments to be made about why you should vote for somebody. You should want to vote for somebody because you're excited to vote for them because their ideals um, either exactly match up to or almost always, uh, you know, almost all of them match up to what, what you want. You, you think that they are the right direction that the country needs to go in, not some status quo bullshit that are, you know, so it's like, why, why are we going back to the exact thing that brought us here in the first place? What logical decision, what logical sense does that make? It kind of doesn't. Um, so, you know, I, I, I'm not going to tell you who to vote for, but I am going to tell you to think critically and take all of the take all of the information and all of the facts into account. Other than, well, we got to get rid of Trump. Sure, I'm not. I don't like Trump either. I think Trump is essentially the, the you know the living and embodiment of what this system is. This corrupt, lying, egotistical, narcissistic, rugged individualism, failing, rotting system. Have I gotten it through? Do you guys do you guys get how I don't like the fucking system in place? And Joe Biden is is basically um, basically the same thing. He's the representation of the exact same system. It's just he has a different letter by his name. You know. His liver spots are in a different place in his head. He has a different hairstyle. That's it. So the superficiality of things is different. That's the the one percent of difference between Trump and Biden. So, you know, so people come up to me and they go, "Well, well, um, Chris, don't vote for Biden. Vote for the Supreme Court justice that he's going to have to put in place. Vote for that Supreme Court justice." Sure, okay. If that's what we're voting for. What, are, what is the likelihood that Joe Biden is actually going to uh, put in a progressive Supreme Court judge that is on the side of the worker, that is on the side of human rights, um, that probably understands that a 200-year-old document, um, you know, that has a couple of amendments to it isn't particular, like maybe that's not the best way to, to run a country that's, constantly changing and evolving that that has made a lot of social strides in the last two decades alone um perhaps there's going to be some discrepancies perhaps the language in which it's written is not particularly great and maybe we need to reevaluate that maybe we need to go by the judgment of the times rather than the judgment of somebody that wrote it 200 years ago hoping that it would last for as long as it did 
Um, I, you know, even one of the founding fathers was like, yeah, we should probably have a revolution every 20 years and we should probably change this thing up every 20 years. This should be an evolving document and adding an amendment is not, that's not the only thing that's, that makes it an evolving document. Now, I, I you know, open to interpretation, that's fine. Uh, and I'm sure I'm going to get a lot of flack and feedback uh, from a lot of people of saying like, you can't fucking touch that concept. I mean, it's, it's a sacred document. Would you want to change the Bible? Yeah, we have. We have changed the Bible. That's like the most sacred document in America, the Christian nation, isn't it? The most sacred document ever has been fucked with and changed and reinterpreted 150,000 times. The, the shade of alabaster white that Jesus is portrayed in has changed. He goes from alabaster to eggshell white, and then he goes to neutral white to milk white. That has changed a hundred thousand times. And you're telling me that you can't look at the Constitution that was written in the language of 1776 and go, maybe they didn't have all this right. Maybe this language needs to be tweaked up a little bit. One of the founding fathers even said that's what we need to fucking do. Anyway, so we won't actually get a progressive in the court. I think what we'll get is a neoliberal judge because even Merrick Garland, the judge that Obama wanted to appoint, that gentleman, 93%, 93% in line with Brett Kavanaugh. So, you know, are we going to get a progressive judge? So Roe v. Wade comes up. So what? We're going we're gonna to either go to um, an authoritarian limit on uh, the subject of abortion um, and open up a Pandora's box to become, you know, to... to uh, renegotiate and reconvene on all of these other um, um, Supreme Court cases that um, have granted s specific civil rights and human rights um, to, you know, overreach and create an authoritarian jurisdiction on those. Um, or we go, well, we're not going to say whether it's illegal or illegal, but we're going to leave it up to the states. Yeah, and that worked out really great. You want to go ask people in Georgia or Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, Texas, Missouri. I mean, the list goes on. Do you want to go ask those people how that worked out? So, you know, the, the problem is not the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court wasn't even meant to have this much power to begin with either. Um, so maybe that's another point of discussion. But that's, I mean, that, you know, that's not a viable enough argument. If we're talking about progressive judges that are going to go up against these neocon neoliberal judges, how many people want to overturn Citizens United other than Ruth Bader Ginsburg right now? And I'm not even sure if she does anymore. Um, the last time I checked, I know she did. There was probably a couple of justices that did. If you know how many justices did go want to go against something like Citizens United, um, leave a comment because I'm I'm. Um, failing to remember this information right now <laughs> so uh, forgive my humanity in, in this uh, situation but if you know the information leave a comment leave a comment and I will um, you know I will take a look at it I'll, I'll, I'll respond to it and you know I think we'll all kind of be better for it but I'm, I'm, I'm gonna guess uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg and maybe one or two other people um, you know that were that were um, the lefty judges voted against something like Citizens United so I don't know if the judges thing is a viable argument. Uh, so let's go down the rest of the list. Cognitive decline. I mean, this guy, that has been on everybody's lips since the first fucking debate. I mean, he got hammered and everybody was like, oh, maybe he just didn't expect to be hammered as much as he... And then it was like the next debate was just like he's stumbling and eking his way by through every response that he could possibly give. He can't finish his sentence. He's talking about corn pop and record players and rubbing kids rubbing his fucking hair and living with cotton. It's like, what are you saying? What do you say? Create a narrative in your head, Joe. Be able to form a full concrete thought. I don't think he's cognitive to doing well. I'm not trying to make fun of him. I'm just trying to point out something that is a reality that we need to face. Don't you think that that if 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 he's going to be the leader of the free world, that he should have some functioning level of cognition? 
I'm bringing that at the, at the very top, at the very top, because that's something that no corporate media, no mainstream pundit or any journalist or anybody from his fucking campaign will actually address with anybody. They actually won't talk about it at all. In fact, that's actually one of the things they said is after a while, uh, I think when it, in like December or something, they basically stopped talking about his cognitive functions. And then if you did bring up his cognitive function, you, you're, you know, oh, you're just trying to get Trump to win. Oh, you're just a, a Putin puppet. You're a, a Russian agent. Some McCarthy is bullshit will happen. Right now, Trump is also uh, in cognitive decline. The only difference is, uh, and Matt Taibbi brought this up. Fantastic journalist, by the way. You should, everybody should check out Matt Taibbi. He brought this up when he was on Joe Rogan's podcast uh, back in November is there's a very good chance that Trump is on speed, right? Like he takes these diet pills um, and, and that's just speed. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's to kind of like amp you up and, and it makes you more, it gives you like a better stream of consciousness. And I've, I've never done speed. I don't fucking know what it actually does to you or, or, or anything like that. But, you know, um, it's supposed to help improve that, the, the, the lack in cognition, but I'm sure it's also killing him on the inside. So there's also that if, if, if the DNC gave Joe Biden speed, I think he would be dead. Moving on, uh, no Medicare for all. That was something that Biden said that he was not going to do. Um, he even said it, if Medicare for all came to me as a bill uh, that was supported by all the people in his party, uh, he'd veto it as president. In the middle of a fucking pandemic, he says this. In the middle, when, when hospitals are stressed out, when the, when the profit-driven uh, healthcare system isn't able to actually do anything to help its citizens, he says this. When everybody's asking for a way to, um, you know, financially help uh, each other and Medicare for all would be a way that it to, to, to help everybody that is in need during a global pandemic, he goes, no, we have to let the insurance companies make money. In an emergency situation where the profit-driven insurance companies and healthcare model has failed society. He is unwilling to try something different. He has abysmal foreign policies, abysmal foreign policies. Uh, he voted for the Iraq war. And when he was challenged by the U S weapons inspector, Scott Ritter, he talked down to him. He condescended him. He treated him like shit, uh, called him Scotty boy basically said that he doesn't get to make these sort of calls because he doesn't get the big bucks. That's literally what he said to him in the meeting. There's, there's an interview with Scott Ritter um, that Aaron Maté, another fantastic journalist at the Gray Zone, uh, uh, did with, with Scott Ritter talking about what he found in Iraq and basically saying like, hey, this isn't like you guys can't force this stuff on them. Um, they're, you know, and, and we didn't really find anything. Um, and he basically talked down to them. And he said, oh, so you want the control, Scotty. You want the control. You don't make the big bucks. So basically, to Joe Biden, if you don't have money, you don't have any status. You don't get to make any decisions. You don't get to um, have rights. You don't get to have your opinion valued. You don't get to make an opinion, period, because you, you, are, you are not monetarily wealthy. What he wants you to do is if you're not monetarily wealthy... Uh, is be subservient to those that are, which is um, an oligarchy. It's a plutocracy. Plus, he was part of uh, Obama's increased uh, drone warfares and extending all the wars in the Middle East. So we went from two to seven under the Obama administration, and Joe Biden was part of that administration. Joe Biden was part of the administration that increased all these wars. Uh, you know, so Joe Biden is not a fan of peace. Uh, he definitely profits from um, from war, just like, you know, virtually, virtually every other member of Congress. This is an economy that's run by war. So of course they support it. Here's another thing. This, this kind of goes into why, uh, Biden has the attitude that he does is, uh, the last coherent thing he said, and this was the very beginning of his campaign. I, I don't know if people still remember this or not, but I sure as fuck do. Um, 
he said that he doesn't have any empathy for millennials. He doesn't have any empathy for us. Hey, oh, you're you're struggling. You got all this debt. You know, because we fucked over uh, the working class people by deregulating the banks and deregulating the pharmaceutical companies and deregulating insurance companies, letting them control and do whatever they wanted and fuck over the American people by shoveling more of the money up at the top. And we continue to bail out the banks. We continue to bail out the financial industries. We continue to bail out the insurance companies and the, and the big corporate conglomerates and let people have monopolies fucking over the America. But that's on. That's your fault. That's your fault. I have no empathy. You should have done something different. <laughs> and, this, and this is how he's continued to behave throughout the campaign. There, there, are, um, there are activists that have come up to him. Uh, there have been journalists that have, been come, up, kind of, that have come up to him. Uh, there was one journalist where uh, he, he said, Hey, so Bernie Sanders is talking about Medicare for All and seems very popular. Um, why won't you consider? And he goes, why, 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 like, I do, like, uh, and the journalist is like, what's happening right now? What is this? There was a fossil fuel activist that literally said, what are we going to do about these pipelines? And he was like, yeah, we got to do something about them. And he goes, yeah, so, so w what are we going to do? Like, what are you going to do if you're president about these pipelines? Will you restrict these pipelines from being built? you know, on native ground over, over, uh, water, uh, resources and uh, over people's homes. Are you going to stop the poisoning of, uh, of American communities because of pipe? And he goes, Hey, I'm not your guy. You should vote for somebody else. Like he literally said that to somebody. And we'll conclude with this, <laughs> uh, the sexual assault of Tara Reed. Um, Tara Reed originally went on Katie Halpert's podcast and told the story of how Joe Biden sexually assaulted her. I'm not going to uh, go, go into that, that story. I, I do recommend that you guys go check it out. And then she, and then, um, you know, she was on, uh, rising, um, hill.tv, crystal and Sagar and Jetty, uh, great program. I enjoy it. Uh, you know, I, I don't agree with them all the time, but I like the coverage that they do They're there and, and the way that they cover it. They're very thorough. And they let Tara talk. Um, and she points out, uh, you know, some of the horrible things that Joe Biden uh, said to her as he was sexually assaulting her. Like, oh, I thought you liked me. Um, and then when she resisted and, and, you know, eventually got him off, he said that she was nothing to him. This is Joe Biden. 100% through and through. This is who he is. And it explains his attitude towards Anita Hill. Because to Joe Biden, if you're in a position of power, um, any behavior of ill repute is, uh, is fine. The aggression, the condescension, all of that makes sense if you look at it through that lens. If you believe that you're in a position of power and you can do and get away with whatever the fuck you want. Of course you're going to treat Anita Hill the way that you did. Of course you're not going to apologize to her. Now Joe Biden hasn't said a goddamn word about it. And I'm sure he has a team of lawyers that are like, shut the fuck. Dude, you can't make a sentence come out of your mouth that makes any Do you really think an apology on an issue this big is going to even make sense. Like, and then you have fake, fake fucking progressives like Alyssa Milano that completely ignore Tara Reid, but they do come after Brett Kavanaugh. So where, where is she on that Me Too movement? You know, so, so that's a fake progressive right there. And these are the greatest hits. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that I'm missing. The segregationist stuff, he, was, he, he supported segregationists in the, during the civil rights movement. He's never been on the side of the worker. I'm sure I'm missing a bunch of stuff. That'll be a fun comment section to see is how many people come up with other shit that Joe Biden has done that I didn't talk about. I just, I just, I just made the greatest hits. These are just the greatest hits. Uh, things that I think need to be talked about pretty consistently. Because here's the thing. Uh, Trump is also convicted um, uh, or, or been accused of sexual assault several times by many people. right? And I'm sure... 
there were seven women that that came out and said that G Joe Biden made them feel very uncomfortable because he got way too close and lingered on a hug and he holds children and sniffs them. Um, very regret. Like it's creepy to watch those videos. Um, Trump does the same thing. Trump also not a big fan of Medicare for all, but he's implementing his own version of it. Like the CARES Act is essentially like, hey, if you've been, if you think you have COVID, just go to the hospital, and if you even if you don't have insurance, just fucking go and get it checked out, and tell them, you know, CARES Act, and and it, the hospital will be billed under, uh, you know, Medicare or whatever, and you know. Trump even came out and he wasn't really for war. Now he's escalating things by putting sanctions on Iran and by k illegally killing the, uh, you know, one of the premier leaders of Iran, General Qassem uh, Soleimani, uh, who was on a peace mission when uh, Mike Pompeo and Donald Trump uh, illegally assassinated this world leader, <laughs> along with, uh, you know, uh, uh, high officials in, of the Iraqi government as well. So, you know, where are we at? How are these two people different? After everything I've just pointed out, how are they different? I don't really see that much of a difference. Um, I made a joke today on, on, the, on the Twitters, uh, and I've been joking, you know, back and forth with, the, with a couple of my friends about this as well, is... Um, I don't, to be honest with you, I don't know what I'm going to do in November. I, I, I really don't have um, an answer for you guys. I probably won't until I get into that voting booth. Um, you know, I've never had an opportunity to vote. And uh, guess what? Not particularly excited about it. Not fucking psyched. Like zero psych about this at all. Yeah. Like I don't, I'm, I'm not excited. Americans can sit there and be like, well, we all hold our nose and, and vote. Well, great, but I'm an immigrant. I've lived here for 22 years um, by just, you know, having you guys holding your nose and voting and the country going to shit. So if we're going to vote, I kind of take that shit a little bit more seriously because I haven't had the opportunity to for 22 years. But they've had the opportunity to make laws and legislation uh, not on my behalf, completely fuck me over and me not being represented because I can't, I can't be that representation for myself. So I depended on you guys. And as far as I see it, um, you know, the left has failed the, or the liberals, whatever have, have failed, you know, people like me. And now that I have the opportunity to vote, I take that shit very seriously um, so no, I'm not interested in holding my nose and voting for somebody that I don't give a shit about. This is a serious thing. So I've been, being that it's serious, of course, me been joking around is, um, you know, to do a writing campaign. Um, I'm, there's a restaurant in, uh, I believe Norfolk, Lo Portsmouth, Portsmouth, Virginia, near, near Norfolk, Virginia, called Longboards, fantastic restaurant. And uh, when I was there in January, um, Jason and Jesse, two very good friends of mine from Lurie Creek, a uh, great band you should check out, uh, took me to Longboards after the show and we were hanging out, having a couple beers. And uh, I had these uh, boneless chicken tenders and this like spicy sauce. It was incredible. Um, I might write that in uh, instead of Joe Biden. Or... I might write in Eugene Debs. Both of those options, um, a person that has been dead for nearly a century um, and very delicious chicken tenders from a amazing restaurant in Portsmouth, Virginia, both have more cognitive ability and have been less rude to the American people uh, than Joe Biden has been in the last 40 fucking years. Cheers. So, <laughs> um, we're going to move to the second uh, topic of our discussion. Who the fuck is Governor Andrew Cuomo, really? There's all this fawning happening about uh, Governor, Governor Andrew Cuomo. Boy, people like this guy a lot. Who the fuck is he? Where did he come from, you know? 
Um, I've, I've heard of Andrew Cuomo in passing mostly, you know, um, he, he's never been somebody that I particularly cared about. And then, uh, I forgot that his brother was on CNN and I don't like his brother. <laughs> that's kind of where I'm at. Um, so that's my introduction to Andrew Cuomo, the governor of New York. Um, and a lot of people like him. Especially now, there's this like overwhelming amount of fawning uh, for the last month over you know Andrew Cuomo, and a lot of people are just like, "Oh my God, this guy! Oh, can we trade Joe Biden for Andrew Cuomo? Please, please, can we do that? That'd be so great if we could trade in the Biden for the Cuomo." Um, and the reason why people like him is because you know he's got this poised, empathetic briefings that he's doing during the pandemic and. Um, and, and as we just talked about, Joe Biden, no empathy, no empathy for these millennial, fuck these people, huh? These goddamn working class people coming in, asking me for basic human rights, for treating health care as a human right instead of a goddamn, pre you got to earn it. You got to earn your health care. You, you're dying of pancreatic cancer. What did you do to earn hospital treatment? You piece of shit. That's, you know. They're like, well, I don't know if that guy's going to be great. Uh, and now everybody's like, oh, Cuomo, Cuomo can do it. He's so nice. He's, he says these things. He doesn't call millennials a piece of shit. You know, he doesn't yell at cancer patients or sniff uh, girls. <laughs> Jack, is that the, is that the barometer? <laughs> is, is, well, Andrew Cuomo hasn't sniffed any children lately. Oh boy, <laughs> this guy's presidential. <laughs> we really didn't think that sniffing kids thing was going to go off as much as it did. <laughs> like the DNC is just like, I thought all those photos where he's sniffing women and children, you know, we thought that we thought they would never resurface in the age of the internet where everybody pays attention to everything all the time. Now that now that it has, uh, what I don't know. What do we do? King Democrat Joe Biden is kind of a kind of a, a creepy son of a bitch. C Cuomo, he doesn't say poor people should die in a weird half sentency way, uh, but he's kind of the opposite of that. He's kind of the opposite of the way that he's really presented. Um, Andrew Cuomo in uh, 2013 cut 500 beds in a Brooklyn hospital. Hasn't done anything to help uh, hospitals in the Bronx, which um, I believe is a predominantly black neighborhood, black borough of New York. I believe. I'm not sure. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that is uh, accurate. I might not be, though. Um, if I am, comment in that comment section. Um, and and right now, during, during this pandemic, he cut uh, in order to you know, do the budget for the state of New York. He cut $400 million from Medicaid, uh, and that is his austerity measures. We're being stern to defeat this virus. We're going to defeat it through American hubris and exceptionalism. Cuomo! Uh, he did that to secure the health care system. He cut the, he cut Medicaid, uh, you know, so so now if you have, you know, the Medicaid, you might not be able to go to the hospital. Uh, and I guess the virus is like, oh, well, I mean, if people aren't going to go to the hospital, what is the point of infecting them? Because you know how viruses operate. They always look at the bottom line and uh, the profit motives of things. So uh, in order to keep this, keep these budget cuts and this austerity measure that he wants to do, um, to scare the virus with austerity, little, little, little austerity, uh, you know, and then coronavirus is like, oh my God, go to Canada. They have no austerity in Canada. Go, go, get it. Do we have our papers? Does the virus have its papers? Because we have to cross the border. Did we bother to get a passport? In order to keep these austerity measures, uh, Andrew Cuomo uh, refuses six billion dollar federal aid um, in order to make sure that his budget cuts will stay the way that it is. Because in order, to, if he does get the federal aid, he's not going to be able to to, to uh, 
um, to make these budget cuts. He's not going to be able to cut and slash and do all these things, right? Um, so he wants <laughs> he wanted to keep his four four hundred million dollar uh, Medicaid cut and refuse a six billion dollar federal aid uh, that would have helped the hospital systems. Uh, you know, like right now, it's like fucking New York City. They're 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 like digging mass graves and shit. It's crazy. That's fucking nuts. Uh, you know, ho- the hospital system is is overwhelmed. Uh, it, and what is budget for 2020 did not include um, is property or wealth taxes for the ultra rich. Um, they got cuts. They're not being taxed on that stuff. Uh, which you know, when you talk to these people. They're like, well, if we tax the rich, they're not going to want to do uh, business here. They're, they're going to go elsewhere. What if they go to Delaware, for fuck's sake? That's Joe Biden's state. You know, they're, they're all going to get sniffed. Who is going to want to live in a state where they can't afford health care? Who is going to want to live in a state where um, you, you declined $6 billion of federal aid Made four hundred million dollar cuts in, um, in 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 a Medicaid program to help your uh, most vulnerable people, uh, on top of other cuts that you made, and essentially ended up. It, it, by the end of it, he 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 um, he forgoed nine billion dollars of aid. If you look at the cuts that he made and the aid that he refused. But it's okay, right? Because he sounds nice. He forms these sentences and he speaks with... He makes these pauses that make him sound, you know, like he cares. He's watched some De Niro performances, you know? He he watched Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. He saw how impassioned that actor was. And he was like, I could probably replicate that. That doesn't seem so hard. I mean, he uses these $5 words, so he's got to be. I mean, these guys, he's got to be a good guy. You know, he sounds like he scored really well on the SATs. So it's okay when he fucks over the poor. It's okay. It's fine. No big deal. At least when he's fucking over the poor... You know, it, it, it sounds eloquent. Oh, yes. As he's, as he's destroying the lives of many working class in America, it, it, it's the sweet sound of opening up a champagne bottle that we'll never be able to afford. And, oh, yes, uh, and, and eating some caviar. That's, that's the sound of Andrew Cuomo. The doctors and nurses do not like this guy. <laughs> Uh, there's a couple reports of, uh, you know, some alternative news media and it's talked to some doctors and nurses and they're basically like, this guy is the reason why we are in the, the situation that we're in, um, when it comes to the shoddy healthcare system that we're in, um, you know, because he cut the beds, uh, because, uh, you know, basically the hospital managers were like, hey, these beds are empty and we can't really make any money off of them. So what's up? Uh, and Cuomo was like, fine, we'll cut them. So hospital beds get cut because, uh, you know, the healthcare system is, is pointing in the way of uh, making money and not actually helping people when they need to help people. So because it's not making them a profit, they cut the beds and Cuomo was all for that. Um, you know, he supports the profit driven thing. And all of a sudden now he's like, well, we got to take care of sick people. And he says that, and then he cuts, he makes more budget cuts, uh, towards an already strained healthcare system. But if you had healthcare on a government system, if you had a Medicare for all, if you had a universal healthcare program where everybody had opted in and, and the healthcare was already paid for because it was a nationalized uh, system rather than a privatized system, a public system, uh, regardless of who was using that bed, the hospitals get paid anyway. Still, still think Medicare for all is, is worse now that we're, now that we're in a situation where, where, it, you know, beds were cut because the hospital wasn't making any money. And now we need all of those beds back again. 
Hospitals monetize sickness, right? The insurance company monetized the ill. The private uh, privatization of, of healthcare monetized human life. And Andrew Cuomo, Andrew Cuomo wants to make a little money on the back end of all of those things. That's who Andrew Cuomo really is. So, <laughs> I hope you guys are doing okay. I, I can't, I'm, I'm trying to not end these things on a super heavy note, um, but, uh, but sometimes it ends on a super heavy note to help you realize uh, that the people that we fawn over aren't particularly fucking awesome. Uh, sometimes uh, they're, they're just big old fuckbags and, uh, uh, you know, that are trying to make money off sick people. And we should stop supporting these people. <laughs> All right. Um, let's move to the final uh, story. We're going to talk about the Great Strike of 1913 in New Zealand. Um, the reason I wanted to cover this is because I've been talking about a lot of North American strikes. I talked about Winnipeg. I've talked about Seattle and San Francisco, the Boston police strike, Homestead strike, uh, everything that Eugene Debs did, the railroad strikes. Um, you know, So I've gotten a ton of American strikes, but I wanted to see how other countries were handling uh, the labor movement. So uh, the first one that popped up to me that, uh, that I thought was kind of interesting was the Great Strike of 1913, which is really a series of strikes throughout the country, right? Um, and this is particularly in the island nation of New, or uh, New Orleans. Fucking idiot. Um, <laughs> New Zealand. <laughs> the island nation of New Orleans, uh, where the whole city was shut down because of Mardi Gras problems. Uh, no, New Zealand. Uh, if you don't know what New Zealand looks like, let's take a look at it. Ba-bam, there's New Zealand. Nice little island there. Um, got the map pulled up for you guys. So uh, that's the northern part of the island. That's the southern part of the island. Um, oh, maybe I'll. Oh yeah, I can do that. That's a smart idea, Chris. Good job. Good job using the the zoom feature on the map there. Um, so that's the island there. And we're going to talk about, you know, when, when we get to these strikes, because it happens in multiple different parts, I will uh, show you exactly where, you know, these strikes are happening and why certain aspects of them are, were, were important the way that they were. Um, so um, this really starts in 1890, uh, where uh, there were a bunch of maritime strikers and, uh, and, they, and they unfortunately got defeated, right? Um, there was a lot of violence involved, and uh, the unions just weren't able to hold up, so they backed down. They lost a lot of power. They lost a lot of funding. Uh, so 1890, the unions are kind of in a rocky position in New Zealand. And then by 1894, uh, the Minister of Labor, William Pemberton Reeves, I love these names. They're fucking amazing. Um, he created the Industrial Conciliation and Arbitration Act, which basically uh, made it compulsory... Uh, and I'm using the word compulsory because I don't get to use that word very often. Fucking great word. Uh, but it made, the, made it compulsory, made it mandatory for employers to uh, arbitrate. Uh, arbitration became a mandatory thing um, between unions and employers, right? So, so the unions were kind of absorbed under this arbitration act, um, and the employers had to comply. Uh, and what this act really did was it outlawed employer lockouts um, and union-related strikes. So employer lockouts, uh, if you remember from yesterday's, um, yesterday's talk about the Homestead strike, um, you know, Henry Frick locked out the, the workers uh, that were associated with the unions. Well, really all the workers, because the unions were representing all the workers and hired uh, strike breakers that he was secretly bringing in with um, the help of, you know, the, the, the Pinkerton Detective Agency, which is basically hired guns, right? Um, so... In 1894, in New Zealand, they outlawed that. They basically say, you can't do that. You have to negotiate. You have to sit down with the unions. And the unions can't do what, you know, what their, their kind of tool is, their, their strongest tactic is, which is strikes, right? So the unions weren't able to strike. 
Now, part of this is because this kind of gave unions a little bit more strength back, um, especially in a time where they didn't have that much strength, right? Because they got defeated four years earlier. And it was basically an act that made uh, collective bargaining into a law. Um, and it was arbitrated by, you know, this, this particular act, this particular committee, um, where it, it, forced, it, it forced people to, to listen to each other. Um, and in theory, it sounds really fucking great. And for a little while, it worked. It was kind of going okay. Um, and the only unions that were able to directly uh, negotiate with the workers that were allowed to strike were uh, the unions that were already part of the Trade Union Act. They were allowed to strike, right? So, the, so there were a couple unions in New Zealand that... Um, were part of the Trade Union Act that got kind of grandfathered over into being able to continue striking, being able to uh, stand up for the worker and use the strike as a tool uh, when negotiations failed. But there weren't a lot of unions that were part of that. Um, that was, you know, that was kind of a rarity at that time. And, you know, to a lot of people, um, when, this, uh, when this Arbitration Act was put into place, this was a win for them. This was a win for unions that were uh, demoralized, defunded. This was a win for the working class people because they finally felt like, you know, uh, because it was basically a collective bargaining law that was put into place, they felt like the government was on their side. They were actually being represented uh, by, by their government and state officials. Uh, and it was a win for the employers because, you know, the employers get to, um, you know, essentially continue making money. That was, that was sort of the win for them. So it seemed like this was going to be, this is going to be a very easy, peaceful way of resolving any sort of labor movement issues that were going to come up. Now, by 1908, which was uh, about 14 years after this act is put into place, the workers were pretty much done with it. Um, they kind of didn't feel like they were getting a whole lot out of this act anymore. You know, they were they were just like, no, nah, we're, we're not we ain't getting shit. We keep getting screwed over. Everything is nothing has really changed. Um, so there was no increase in pay. There was no overtime. There was no betterment of work conditions. And these are basically the things that they kept asking for. They kept saying like, hey, our work conditions aren't great. Our hours are not great. Our, um, you know, we don't have any overtime. Like we're not getting paid for overtime, which is crazy. Uh, and so they would arbitrate. And then nothing would happen. Um, so, because of this, a lot of, a lot of workers that you know, a lot, and a lot of unions that were really under the uh, Arbitration Act were were you know like this is bullshit. We're gonna go and join one of these um, trade trade union act unions, the the unions that are allowed to strike because we got to do something here, right? So. A lot of them joined the United Federation of Labor, uh, not to be confused with the United Federation of Planets from Star Trek. Uh, that is a different thing, although possibly, maybe, uh, inspired by this. We may never know. We may never know. <laughs> but uh, the United Federation of Labor... Uh, was a labor organization that was um, able to strike, grandfathered by the uh, Trade Union Act, and um, they got nicknamed the Red Fed, the Red Federation, is what uh, what people started calling the UFL, uh, the United Federation of Labor. The Red Fed is what they kept calling them. And part of the reason was because they were talking about a lot of socialist movements. They were talking about you know, things that they were uh, seeing happen in other countries. So there were a bunch of uh, members that were inspired by the Socialist Party of America, which was um, uh, the, the party that was started by one Eugene Debs that ran uh, under the Socialist Party of America five times, um, you know, really kind of hitting a blow towards the Democratic Party and Woodrow Wilson, who was, you know, implementing things like the Espionage Act and this hyper-nationalization um, during World War I uh, that he opposed of, um, you know, was kind of stagnating wages and things of that sort. And um, some of the members of the UFL saw how Debs was going about doing things, the philosophies that Debs was talking about. 
And they, um, they took all that and they came back to New Zealand and they were like, we'll implement that. So, and then um, a lot of other people were also members of the International Workers of the World, the IWW, right? Um, so they were, they were part of the IWW. The IWW arguably is a little bit more militant than the Socialist Party of America, than really even what the, the UFL uh, was. Um, they were really about direct action. They were really about showing that, you know, the workers aren't going to be uh, pushed around as much. So, um, you know, so because of these two ideologies, this term red fed kind of came around. Um, uh, I, I don't know if it was a term of endearment. I, I, I genuinely doubt that it was. I genuinely doubt it. <laughs> like, I feel like this was like a fuck you to them. So, things started kind of popping off um, as these workers are leaving the Arbitration Act, joining the UFL. We get to 1912, um, to the Wahihi Strike. Um, I don't know if I'm actually pronouncing that right. I wonder if I can find it on the map. Uh, maybe I can, if I get close. Um of where is Wahihi? This happened in 1912. Uh, I might not be able to find it, by the way. This might be, this might just be me putzing around a map and not being able to find it very well. Uh, it's Queenstown, there's Wellington, Napier. If I can't find it, I can't find it. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I did my best, you guys. I did my best. Um, but uh, that why he he why he why he strike why he strike. I'm I'm sorry if I'm butchering the name of it. Uh, but this happened in 1912, and I mean this was a direct violent strike, right? The 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 uh, workers went on strike, and then the conservative uh, the conservative reform leader. William Massey, who had come into power just, you know, a year or two earlier, basically used the police force and defeated the strikers. So just straight up, they were like, hey, we're declaring a strike. And this guy was like, great, we're going to shoot you in the face. Um, and it's like, wait, what? <laughs> we just want to talk. Good. Talk to our guns. OK, you got these guns. That's what you're going to talk to. We're locked and loaded, motherfucker. <laughs> right. Like that's. So. The UFL got criticized by the by the IWW because they didn't take enough of a direct action. Uh, they were very hesitant on the strike. They were kind of like, you know, they 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 were a little wishy washy, and and then you know the police force came in, and uh, because they weren't as forceful as as the IWW thought they should be, um, you know, they got blamed for for letting the strike kind of dissolve in a matter of seconds. So. That happens in 1912, and then a year later is when things pop off with the Great Strike, where in October of 1913, after um, you know not being treated well, after not being heard, after the Arbitration Act constantly failing them over and over again, more and more people are joining the UFL. The UFL basically goes, all right, we got to do it. We got to get this strike going. And... Um, it started with coal miners, shipyard workers, uh, water siders, and they all started striking. Um, and, you know, the, the employers of these things were trying to negotiate, uh, and they kept saying, look, we'll negotiate with you, but we really need to, um, what we really need to do is go back to the Arbitration Act. We got to let the Arbitration Act do what it was meant to do. Uh, and the reason why the employers were saying that is because, well, the Arbitration Act was you know, on their behalf. Uh, the Arbitration Act had uh, basically given the employers everything that they wanted. They were negotiating on behalf of the employers. So the notion of, uh, well, it seems like the government is actually siding with the people by making this collective bargaining uh, law uh, was barely anything for the people. It just brought people to the negotiating table to be like, look, look, here's the rights we're going to take away from you. Do you guys see this? And it's gone now, right? Like the government was siding with these employers and these corporations more than they were with the, uh, with the people. And um, 
some of the unions um, didn't really particularly care to do a strike. Uh, they were not excited um, about striking. They thought it was the wrong time because it was the wrong season to strike. Um, it was October, uh, and it was a slow season for coal mining and shipyards and water siding and stuff like that. So, um, you know, they were like, this is, if you guys strike, they're just going to get other people because it's also slow farming season. So there's a bunch of farmers that don't really have that much to do on their farms that are going to join and become scabs. So like this strike doesn't seem like it's timed very well. Um, you know, and really where things were starting uh, at the very beginning of this in October of 1913 was in Auckland and Wellington, the Northern Islands. So I do know where that one is. Uh, so we're, we're looking at the Northern Islands up at the top here. So, uh, you know, there you can see Auckland at the very top. You can see Wellington um, there. Uh, you know, so we're looking at you can see that there's a lot of coastal areas, Wellington specifically and Auckland specifically, coastal areas. And then basically the people from the center would be the farmers that would come out to these uh, coastal towns and become scabs. They would become scabs for these people. And that was a concern for them, um, you know, because they were also out of work. So, but what was different about this is... Um, that the farmers weren't used as scabs. Um, they were actually used to defer um, actual military action. They deputized the farmers. The government and the military deputized a bunch of these farmers, um, and they basically said if the military shows up or if the cops show up, it's not going to look good because they're peaceably striking they are making speeches, they are organizing, and they're doing all these things. It's going to make us look like a bunch of fucking assholes if we show up with the, you know, with the HMS and point cannons at these people. Uh, so let's deputize these farmers that don't have anything to do and send them out to take care of it. So we'll, we'll take one side of the working class, right? Because the farmers union uh, wasn't on the UFL side. They weren't on the IWW side. Um, they thought their actions were too over the top, and uh, they actually wanted to go back to the Arbitration Act. So because they were, they, even the farmer union was on the Arbitration Act side, uh, they basically went and they were like, yes, we'll do it. You know, we, we need the extra money. We're going to go ahead and um, become deputized and take care of them. So they called them specials. Um, and what's funny is, so this is basically Pinkerton's, right? The Pinkertons were, woo, like if you remember from yesterday, we talked about the Pinkertons, we were talking about they were kids, they were students, they were out of work, you know, men trying to feed their family for two fifty a day. Um, and the and they did the same thing in Winnipeg in 1919, the specials, right? They, they deputized a bunch of out of work people, they deputized a bunch of students and kids, um, and they called them specials and they went out and they fought alongside the, the police force and essentially to try to boast their numbers and to, to pad their numbers. Um, and, you know, when in, in New Zealand, when this happened, I mean, it was it was violent. Um, the specials showed up. They tried to, you know, break up these strikes and, uh, you know, they they used revolvers. They would start shooting at these strikers. Um, and the strikers had to retaliate, and so they did, and they fought back. Um, it was tougher to take the inner, like the inner island cities, but they did take the wharfs. Uh, so in Auckland, which is where we were looking at here, in Auckland and Wellington specifically, uh, which is the southern part of the northern island and the northern part, so basically those two specific cities, they were able to take the wharfs, and they were, um, you know, kind of gaining some ground and gaining some traction. So at this point, um, you know, strike leaders started getting arrested, uh, which is very similar to what they did, what Ole Hansen did in 1919, demoralization. Um, demoralization was usually the first point of tactic for, for North American strikes. 
Um, this one seems like it's a little different. The New, the New Zealanders were, were uh, the New Zealand government, at least at that time, seemed like they were heading more towards uh, violent uh, attacks uh, than trying to demoralize them. But eventually this, the, the strike leaders did start getting arrested uh, and they started getting arrested around um, the, they, they kept saying that they were, uh, you know, getting arrested for sedition. That was the big thing. Oh, it's sedition. We're arresting them because it's sedition. Um, and, you know, if there's any bigger proof of an oligarchical plutocracy, you know, that's, it's, it's calling anybody that is standing up for the working class individuals, that's standing up for worker rights and basic human rights in the workplace, uh, a traitor. So if you stand up for the working class and you stand up for basic human rights in the workplace, you're a traitor to the country. I mean, that is basically the oligarchical plutocracy, right? Like, and this happened worldwide, like worldwide, this, this seems to be happening in terms of, in terms of the worker movement is if you stand up for the worker, they're going to call you a traitor, <laughs> you know, red fan, you know, they're going to, uh, lad of Lenin, Bolshevik movement, whatever the fuck it is, they'll, they'll make up these things and, and, um, and, and arrest you, essentially. Um, they also arrested them for inflammatory language, uh, which I'd love to fucking hear that inflammatory language, wouldn't you? Like, I would love to have heard some of these speeches that they were giving. Um, because there's some fucking Eugene Deb speeches that I've listened to, and I'm like, and then I get fired up, and I'm like, where, when are we taking the system down? Let's fucking do this shit, right? And then it's just like me in my pajamas, um, and I'm like, maybe I should wear better pants to the revolution, you know? Um, but it does, it kind of fires you up a little bit. Um, but it's one of those things where it's like speaking truth to power gets you arrested, right? It gets you a prison sentence in this situation, even in America, even in America where, where freedom of speech, freedom to peaceably assemble, freedom to criticize your government is all part of your fundamental rights when it comes down to fighting for the working class, when it comes down to saying that the, the 1%, the rich people, the bosses, the people that run these organizations that aren't treating their employees properly should be held accountable for and should shift their business, uh, business models to treat their employees better that's an arrestable offense. They can't handle a little bit of that truth. That's the problem with the elites. They're just, they're just so fragile that even words will destroy them. You know, they can't handle the truth. The cowards that are afraid of the strength of words is what they are. Because words carry that strength. And they, and they don't have anything that they can say they don't have the fervor, the passion, the drive to really make a concrete argument. Not in the way that Eugene Debs or any of the people in the IWW could. Any of the people, any of these strike leaders could. They're the ones that rally these people. Get them fired up. Get them excited to do some shit. Take action. What are, what are these bosses going to come out and say? Well, I mean, I like money and um i like it when you don't have money and i think that's pretty cool and i think if you don't think that's pretty cool i do have a friend in this military that will fire a cannon at your face um and that's just law you know i'm just doing what the law tells me because i like money and i like it when other people don't have it um, because it makes me feel special because my parents never said that I was special. It was like, boo, boo, and then they throw rocks at him and stuff. I bet that guy would get booked at virtually every corporate comedy club across the world. <laughs> like, everybody that would do, they'd be like, that guy's going to sell some drinks. You know, that guy's going to fucking sell those shots. So as these union leaders get arrested in Auckland, which is the northernmost part of the island there, um, you know, so we're there, it's that one, where you see that one, um, that's, that's where the IWW get involved a lot more, um, and, and they become far more militant. They become far, far more militant, uh, and they start pushing back against these people real fucking hard. 
Um, so, you know, as, as the violence from the, um, the violence from, from the, the authority, the state increases, uh, the IWW decide to push back on them, right? And in Auckland, what ends up happening, and the reason why they become more militant too, is because the specials attacked the strikers and they did, and they covertly attacked them. So as they're having a peaceful demonstration, they hit them hard. Right. And, uh, you know, violence breaks out. A bunch of people die. And uh, and so the IWW go, fuck it. Now it's time for a general strike. We got to get everybody involved. Look at what these people did. Uh, you know, they have no code. They have no ethics. They attacked us when we were uh, trying to be peaceful. They attacked us when we were sleeping. This is bullshit. And uh, six thousand people joined in on that general strike in Auckland. Um, now, the, so the the southern island. Which is down here right uh below wellington you had a lot more of these smaller strikes in smaller towns uh so some of the notable ones were like christchurch uh dunedin and queenstown you know because they are bigger cities they were more notable um than than some of the other smaller ones but they were having smaller strikes that were happening in these in these things but in in the southern towns themselves they were mining towns and basically, the specials that were hired because they're, you know, not trained military people in the in the southern region itself, um, the miners, you know, they were kind of like getting tired anyway. Uh, and uh, the government decided that, OK, it's it's time to stop playing softball with these with these specials, with these farmers that aren't, you know, trained law for law enforcement officials and put police opposition in place. And uh, once that happened, uh, the miners in the south and really once it, it started trickling and, you know, miners everywhere uh, basically wanted to join an Arbitration Act union to go back into the negotiating table with the government um, and the employers. And uh, and that really that was really it. Um, that kind of ended the strike once the miners kind of lost their um tenacity to continue the strike because the cops the police were now getting involved and these are trained professionals with better weapons with better training uh you know they were like we don't we're we don't want to see any more people die uh so this overwhelming military action that did end up taking place the the violence that was started by the state itself by the government of New Zealand itself uh, deputizing and pinning the working class against itself um, tired out the strikes. And uh, at the end of it, you know, the workers didn't really, again, it kind of ended in the early 1900s because of this authoritarian militaristic force. The workers really didn't get what they what they wanted. They didn't they didn't really get a pay raise or better work conditions or overtime or anything else. Uh, but what it did was um, a couple different things. So the IWW members took what they had learned and took how the, you know, how the state does react to things. Um, and they went to Australia with it. But uh, what, what this strike really did, in, and this went on from October to January, it took a, it took a couple months, um, is that uh, it fortified the socialist movement and the labor movement in New Zealand. It really kind of gave them a stronghold of uh, how to use legislation uh, to possibly build a, a better frontier. So uh, a lot of the strike leaders, and this is very similar to, um, to, to what happened in, um, uh, in America as well. There was, there was a lot of strike leaders that ended up going into government, that ended up going into rep, trying to accurately represent the people as part of the working class, right? Um, the, um, the, what is it? The Social Democrats and the United Labor Party combined into one and, and they became a really powerful party by 1935 in New Zealand. So, you know, and that was really because a bunch of strike leaders, a bunch of UFL people, and a bunch of IWW people decided to go into the government and, and decide to, you know, do something about it. Um, and the big takeaway from all this is, it, you know, Look, this is going to happen. If if we if you strike, there are going to be, uh, you know, desperate people 
uh, within the working class that are are unfortunately going to go against their own people. And the hope is that they don't. The hope is that um, you know you can educate these people enough that you can talk to them that when when they when they reinstate the specials when they reinstate the deputization of uh, of the working class against the working class itself um, that we can look at that and go mm, we've tried this okay you know what maybe we shouldn't maybe maybe this this seems wrong this feels wrong um, you know not to let that desperation be exploited. Uh, by those in power. Um, I think that's an important lesson to take away from all this is is that is something that uh, that they do. Uh, so and and really perhaps the the people that really drive the change are these strike leaders, are these people that know how to organize people um, and and really the the thoughts and processes and the philosophies of the IWW and the UFL and um, the AFL and the Socialist Party of America, that's what we need to start learning from. That's what we need to start implementing in our society a little bit more uh, because it seems like that's the right direction to go. It seems like that's the right direction to go. Uh, but uh, that's it. That's the episode today, you guys. Thank you for tuning in. I hope you guys enjoyed it. A little something different for you guys at the end of that. Uh, these have been a little bit long the last couple of days. Uh, but uh, there's been a lot to say in in the topics that I've been trying to talk about. I'm gonna we'll see what happens. Um, but uh, but I I enjoy talking about this stuff. Um, and as as always at the end of it, I I do clip them up and I put them up individually. So if if you are somebody that's like, hey, you know, I'm I'm more interested in the labor movement stuff than I am the Joe Biden or Andrew Cuomo stuff or what whatever it is. Uh, you know, within the next within the next 24 hours, I'll have the individual clips up. So make sure that you are, um, you know, subscribed and stuff to get notifications to uh, to know when I'm uploading these videos, uploading the individual content, um, as well as the full episode stuff. Um, and I and I'm on, uh, you know, I'm, I premiere these in the evenings every day. Um, and I'm into chats to talk to you guys, you know, answer any questions or respond to comments and things of that sort. Um, so, uh, tomorrow we'll, we'll have another episode. Thursday, we'll take that day off and we'll, and I'm going to focus more on the podcast. So I'll have a new taboo table talk this week. Um, and then hopefully I will be, uh, doing two other things, which is, uh, figuring out a format for a live comedy show via zoom and as well as possibly doing a fork full of noodles within the next week or two. Uh, those are the, where my you know, brain is, brain is going to be, um, diverting some energy into. So the other thing I might try to do is maybe only do one story and one labor movement, uh, you know, the next couple of days, you know, start maybe, maybe tomorrow and, and all of next week, I'll do two stories instead of three. Um, just, just so that I can have a little bit more, uh, a little bit more time dedicated to, you know, uh, some of these other writing projects that I have been trying to, to work out and work on. And because I'm doing, you know, more of these videos, um, maybe cutting down the amount of stories that I cover or about ideas, amount of hot takes as it were, uh, you know, I can, uh, and then maybe I can get back to doing three if one of the stories or two of the stories are kind of short, you know, um, but uh, that's that. I think that's that's kind of where my mind has been lately. Uh, but I hope you guys are enjoying it. Um, you know, it, it it I do get excited when people are in the comments. I do get excited when when people uh, chit chat with me in in those in those things. So uh, keep doing that. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Um, but uh, you know, if uh, if you're enjoying the stuff, uh, share it out. Make sure you like it. Make sure you're subscribed to get alerts to, to let you know when videos are going up because usually my content isn't really showed uh, to that many people uh, because of the subject matter of what I'm talking about. Um, it, it's not very algorithm friendly. So make sure that you hit those share buttons, you hit those like buttons um, and make sure that you're subscribed because that's just going to be able to show it to more people that like my page and, and more people that don't and more people that want to like my page maybe. Uh, and if you can, as always, um, you know, if you have the ability to, 
uh, consider donating, becoming a sustaining member, or making a one-time donation. Uh, RamenNoodlesComedy.com slash donate. And to the people that already do, I love you. You guys are amazing. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you.